This story tells about one guy, Taylor Brandon, who since childhood, as a child, adored baseball, and together with his father, did not miss a single game that took place at the home stadium of Seoul. Taylor was an ardent fan, ardently supported local teams, looked up to their best players and trained hard himself. As time passed, the guy grew up and dreamed of entering the field on equal terms with the best player of the opposing team, baseball legend Kim Jinho. Our main character understood that Kim was a professional player. He was strong, strong, well-built, and two heads taller than himself. Taylor, of course, knew a lot about baseball, always showed results, and his career as a professional player had long been established. But the trouble is that Taylor did not stand out in height, as well as in other dimensions, and in general he was of weak physique and physical development. They mocked him, and he perfectly understood why. This made him very angry, irritated, and this feeling forced the main character to change the existing order of things. Every time he imagined how he would respond to his offender, not in words, but in deeds, go out onto the field and show all his skill in a fair game. He envisioned different situations on the field, wanting every pitch he made to be a strike so he could throw the batter out and call a strikeout. After all, Taylor dreamed of becoming the king of baseball, even better than Kim Jinho, at least in the upcoming game. The main character was determined, and nothing could stop him, neither mockery nor sharp jokes. It looks like Kim Jinho has done his job. He has awakened Taylor to action to allow him to achieve his main goal and improve his life. There was one phrase in the guy's head. He had to go and show what he was capable of, and not rely only on his luck. That day, the stadium was packed to capacity. The fans chanted Jinho, 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 and the echo echoed Taylor, Taylor. But these were just dreams of becoming a professional baseball player. He knew that there were increased requirements for professionals and the most severe selection. But this did not stop him when he saw the next advertisement for recruitment into professional baseball. Thousands of players taking part in the selection wanted to get into the best teams in the world at any cost. It was necessary to master not only the basic techniques and terminology, but most importantly, to feel your body. Only 10% of those participating in the selection were lucky enough to wear a professional uniform, but Taylor was not one of them. He was one of those guys who failed to become a professional baseball player year after year, and that was the majority of them. They left the field with serious injuries without the opportunity for a full recovery and a normal life outside of sports. And this happened because everyone was accepted to participate in the selection without taking into account their weight, height, and physical development and little Taylor had to compete and compete with huge thugs, and the protective equipment for the game left much to be desired. Many did not have special shoes or they were in poor condition, the same as the financial situation of the participant. It was because of all this that Taylor had to leave the field and forget about his career as a baseball player forever. He returned to his small courtyard and small one-room rooftop house in a densely populated area of Seoul. Taylor was very thin and weak, he did not look healthy, and his injuries were making themselves felt. He could hardly reach the top shelf of a drawer. Each such movement was not easy for him. Taylor's life was boring, gray, monotonous, and moreover devoid of money and meaning. One evening, when he was once again trying to get something edible from the top shelf of the drawer, someone called him. A courier was waiting for him on the street. He brought a parcel to hand it over personally. It was an old, large cardboard box, quite weighty and voluminous. Strange, but there was nothing written on the box. Our main character could only guess about its contents. It was late at night and the phone rang. It was Taylor's father. He asked if everything was okay with his son, how he was doing, and whether he had received the parcel. The guy at that moment was sitting over an open box with old baseball equipment and did not understand why he needed all this. He asked his father not to worry, said goodbye to him and continued to look at the contents of the parcel. Taylor took a baseball catcher glove out of the box. It was very old and worn. The leather was worn and cracked from time to time and in some places the threads had snapped. The guy put the glove on his hand and looked at it without taking his eyes off, because six long years had passed since he last put it on. The main character automatically took the ball out of the box and placed it between the thumb and forefinger of his right hand. Taylor was still sitting in thought over the box when suddenly a memory from six years ago came flooding back to him, and he realized that he wanted to experience it again. He wondered if he could, if he would be able to throw the ball properly. Probably the main character would have sat there until the morning. But then his gaze fell on the desk that stood by the window. On the desk calendar lying on the table, the number 13, Sunday, was circled in red ink. Three days ago, Taylor received a call from the Mason Company and was invited to a meeting in the president's office to discuss a baseball game. When meeting Taylor, the company president was very polite 
and invited the guy to a baseball game, which would take place on Sunday the 13th. The guy said that he had not trained for a long time, was forced to leave baseball due to an injury that occurred six years ago, and may have already lost his skill. But the company's president, Mason, insisted on his own and did not want to listen either about poor health or injuries. At that very second, the phone rang in the office of the company president, and at the other end of the line they started talking about the game on Sunday and some kind of dispute. The main character tensed. It was about money stakes. The guy was scared. He didn't understand what was happening, what to expect from this game, and no one tried to explain. But let's return to today's events. Taylor sat on the floor, tossed the ball, caught it with a catch glove, thought about the words of the president of the Mason Company, doubted his health and did not understand why he was invited to the game. After throwing the ball up again, the guy suddenly remembered Kim Jin Ho, a baseball legend, a talent from God, the same one Taylor looked up to as a child. If he could have trained more back then, if he had had the strength, if he had eaten well, he would never have just left. At the same hour, the ball flew into Taylor's face and hit him right on the nose. He screamed in pain, covered his nose with his hand, but did not move from his place. When the guy calmed down, he looked around for the ball, found it, and his thoughts never left his head, analyzing what had just happened. Taylor was annoyed. Everything was going wrong. He didn't want to believe that he missed such a simple shot. But what would happen on a real field, in a real game? Out of anger and indignation, he threw the ball and the catching glove back into the box. His head began to boil. Taylor wanted to remove all this stuff, along with the box, out of sight. He couldn't think of any other place than to throw the parcel on the very top shelf in the house, where other unnecessary things were stored in exactly the same boxes. But, as one would expect, the guy's height was not enough. He stood on his tiptoes, trying to reach the very top, his legs straining to the limit. When the fingers could barely hold the ill-fated box, it opened. Something fell out of it and rolled onto the floor. Taylor looked down and saw a strange transparent box on the floor. Behind the clear packaging, on a black stand with an inscription and a gold pedestal, was a new baseball. Taylor looked at the object that had fallen out of the box in confusion. A thousand thoughts ran through his head in a second. And suddenly he realized, this is Kim Jin Ho. The inscription on the ball was made by him with his own hand. Kim Jin Ho was the king of the major leagues, a baseball legend with 11 seasons and 251 games under his belt. He was good in every role. You have to serve, no problem. You have to stand on the bat and that's it. The opposing team will leave with nothing. It was as swift as a hurricane wind. He invaded the field and devastated like a merciless fire. His movements were like a rolling clap of thunder. He set baseball game records time after time. He ruled the big leagues by throwing the ball so hard it couldn't be hit. He was the best of the best, talented, a great sports player, and everyone adored him. Stadiums full of fans and cheerleaders, a beautiful game, and most importantly, victories. Taylor remembered when he was little, sitting in front of the TV, watching Kim's next game and really wanted to grow up like him. There were toys scattered around on the floor, but for little Taylor, the best toy was a baseball bat, which he did not let go of. The boy looked at Kim without taking his eyes off and there was admiration and unforgettable delight in his eyes. Time after time, the stadium was filled to capacity, and everyone was chanting his name, Jinho, 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 and the roar echoed hundreds of miles. Kim Jinho himself considered himself the best and invincible baseball player. But sport, like life, is full of accidents. And at the age of 32, Kim Jinho dies in a car accident, and with him an entire era passes away. Thousands of fans lined the streets of the city, near the stadium, and came to the burial place to say goodbye to the ex-player. That day Taylor, along with his father like many others, brought a farewell flower for his idol. He could not help but come. It would seem that the boy is still very young and does not understand anything about death. But on the day of farewell to Kim Jin Ho, the main character cried bitterly, shuddering convulsively, tears rolling down his face in streams. And now, ten years after his death, he was holding in his hands a treasured box with a baseball inside signed by Kim himself. Well, how did it happen that the legendary player turned out to be powerless in the face of death sitting on the bed, the guy thought. A strange feeling of melancholy and sadness came over him. He really liked that time, his childhood and baseball. And of course, I liked Kim Jin Ho himself in this transparent box in his hands. While Taylor was delving into his memories, the lights in the room went out. It's very strange, the main character thought at that very moment. No one turned off the light but it shouldn't go out on its own. What to do? You have to look for a flashlight. Although, where can you find it in the pitch darkness? Taylor thought. 
The guy continued to rummage in the closet in search of a flashlight and suddenly saw some kind of glow emanating from a transparent box with a ball. He crawled carefully towards the place where the faint light was shining. Thinking about what was happening, he extended his hand to this strange ray of light. Perhaps it was Kim Jin-ho himself who gave him a sign through his baseball, the guy suggested, pronouncing the idol's name out loud. At that very second, Kim's spirit appeared behind Taylor, all illuminated by blue light. The boy screamed in fear, fell to the floor, his hair stood on end. The guy couldn't utter a word, closed his eyes and continued to scream from the overwhelming feeling. The ghost of Kim, who appeared, was also in a daze and did not understand where he was and what kind of screaming boy he was. Taylor was overcome with fear and panic, but he pulled himself together and tried to carefully open his eyes. The guy's eyes opened completely when he saw the one whose name he said out loud. Kim turned out to be such a joker. He didn't understand why the guy was yelling so much. Apparently he had problems with his head, he thought. Taylor put his index finger forward and said that Kim Jin-ho has been dead for 10 years. Kim Jin-ho was perplexed that 10 years ago he was alive, and now he is just a flying ghost, and he strongly disagreed with this. Taylor stood for a long time and looked at the ghost. He could not believe everything that was happening, and would not have believed it if he had not seen it with his own eyes. And at this time, the ghost of Jin-ho, hovering in the air, pointed at some strange object that came from nowhere. In front of the main character was an unusual thing, a virtual glowing screen. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho remembered that he too once had the same virtual window. Looking at the screen, Taylor's eyes reflected an inscription that could possibly change his whole life. A message indicating that the baseball manager has been activated. It was complete night outside, and Taylor sat in front of a mysterious screen and read messages. On the blue screen, he was in the role of a baseball player for the Black Tigers team. The next message said that he had a bronze roulette ticket for one-time use. The ghost of Jin-ho was nearby all this time, and also did not take his eyes off the screen. He pointed to the screen and there were the glasses needed to spin the roulette. It was very realistic and both of them didn't understand whether it was a virtual game or reality. Taylor's brain was confused. It seemed to him that a thousand little Jinhos were flying around and asking a thousand unnecessary questions. These little flying ghosts in the form of Kim were spinning upside down in the air, testing the guy's patience. Taylor could not stand all this fuss, noise and restlessness and barked at the ghost of Kim. At first he was offended, moved to another corner of the room and fell silent. But that was not the case. The ghost, who also skillfully raised his voice and expressed a bunch of arguments about who was right here and who was a boy whining for his life. Taylor thought for a minute, but perhaps Kim was right. But the guy's brains were boiling from what was happening. He saw a ghost for the first time. He saw his game statistics, and he didn't understand how to accept it all. Kim Jin-ho did not stop drew various pictures in Taylor's imagination. And here he is at a psychiatrist's appointment because he sees strange things. So he chews the concentrate so as not to feel weak and a reporter catches him doing this. And then the police take you away by the arm because they caught you eating doping. These not at all rosy pictures drove Taylor crazy. And the ghost continued to escalate the situation with increasing anger. But Kim Jin-ho had the nickname Quiet Assassin, which was not at all worse at the moment. Without looking up from the screen, the guy sarcastically said that he was not so quiet. Taylor watched all his games, including the one where Kim received this nickname. The batter who was hitting his pitches in that match said some nasty words to Kim with a caustic grin, but he didn't know what Kim could be capable of. He considered him quiet. At that match, Kim was unperturbed. He simply replied that he would kill the batter's guy, and then he gave him three strikeouts, and that's when he died in baseball. There was admiration in Taylor's eyes because it was then that Kim Jin-ho, a very taciturn guy, made his debut. Kim didn't even expect that such a trifle, just three words, would cause a lot of emotions in the main character. He was simply warning his opponent to prepare for a strikeout. The ghost kept chatting and chatting about his successes and more, and Taylor got a headache again. He looked at the baseball, the original cause of all this. He then looked at the calendar on his desk, with the number 13 circled. Then he looked into the face of the ghost flying under the ceiling. And then he looked at himself from the outside. Kim Jin-ho suggested that the guy become a baseball manager since such a great opportunity presented itself. Taylor looked at the baseball manager's screen and wondered out loud whether he should believe everything that was happening. Kim hovered just above the floor so that they could look each other eye to eye. He said only one phrase. If Taylor is not afraid and tries all this in reality, he will definitely hit the jackpot. And if not, you just need to take everything for granted Take your medications regularly and focus on treatment. Taylor once went through all this, trying to develop strength and physical power in any weather, be it cold or pouring rain. 
He practiced his throws on a snowy field. He picked up the ball over and over again, hundreds, thousands of times. But all in vain, he never recovered and abandoned baseball for six long years. The truth of Kim Jin-ho was that it was worth testing the baseball manager. This was a chance, the main character decided for himself. The guy got out of bed with some calmness and determination, still continuing to look at the glowing screen. At that moment it seemed to Kim that Taylor had even somehow grown stronger and matured. And at the same time, even he himself doubted whether all this was glitches or reality, but did not dissuade the guy. And while Kim was stuck in his thoughts, Taylor activated his virtual bonus, the bronze roulette. A yellow glow appeared from somewhere above. Some bright rays pierced the room and filled it with light. This light was emitted by a roulette consisting of 96 bronze compartments, three silver and one gold. Taylor looked at her studyingly and immediately calculated that the chance of receiving a gold prize was only 1%. The boy wondered if he really wanted to spin the roulette. But the guy's right hand, with his index finger extended forward, was already reaching for the bronze tape measure that was still hanging in the air. Screaming at the top of his lungs and closing his eyes, Taylor spun the tape measure with all his might. Looking at this action, the ghost of Kim Jin-ho doubted whether everything was all right, or maybe this boy had lost his mind. Sunday morning arrived, the very 13th number circled on the calendar. It was time to go to the stadium, to the game, where the president of the company, Mason, persistently invited Taylor. The stadium was public, social, reminiscent of sand, and anyone could visit it. In addition, there was also a bunch of different garbage that was blown around by the wind and flew right into your face. Taylor was already at the stadium when suddenly someone called out to him. It was manager Smith, who coached him as a boy back in his school days. The manager was glad to see the guy. It was Smith who witnessed the conversation when President Mason invited Taylor to the game. He immediately invited the guy to warm up before the game and handed him a baseball in the hope that Taylor's former injuries would not make themselves felt. Smith took his position on the field and signaled his readiness to play. Taylor was not very happy with this proposal, but did not want to back down and show his weakness. Well, warm up, so warm up, the guy thought, and took a step into the circle to serve. He took his position in the center of the circle and began to prepare to serve the ball. Six years have passed. Will he be able to throw this ball at all? Even in this circle he has not stood all these six years, the boy was racing in his head. Manager Smith continued to shout from his position for Taylor to throw the ball. The guy agreed, warning that it would be a quick serve. At this time, President Mason, the boss of the Tigers, appeared at the stadium with the rest of his players. He greeted Smith and Taylor with obvious mockery on his face. Boss Mason was not the nicest person. Rather, not at all. He is a gambling addict, very greedy and dependent on money. The Tigers team, led by Mason, took seats in the stands and watched Taylor serve. To some extent, this was already a selection for the team. Taylor diligently stretched his legs in a circle. He got ready, took a certain stance. The ball was waiting in the wings in the glove trap. He didn't even realize that someday he would have to do this again. The guy thought at that moment. He prepared to serve a fast serve with the clear intention of catching manager Smith off guard. Taylor took one step and kicked as hard as he could off the bar in the center of the circle. He turned his body to the right and swung as far as he could. Technique, speed, strength, and here he is the strongest throw. At least that's what it seemed to the guy. Taylor focused on the target, the baseball flying to the side in the catcher's position, which was occupied by Smith. President Mason and the guy sitting in the stands watched with interest what was happening. The ball bowled by Taylor flew straight into the trap of manager Smith, who caught it with ease. It became quiet on the podium. Mason's face froze with disappointment, and ridicule flew from the guys like sparks. Taylor slumped, sweat rolling down his face, and the ghost of Kim Jin-ho floated in the clouds, watching what was happening. Manager Smith did not let up. He suggested that Taylor try to throw again. The main character again prepared his body for the throw, took a ready position and swung his arm. The ball was flying along the same trajectory and Smith reacted in time to the throw of his partner, pitcher Taylor. With the same ease, the ball was again trapped by the catcher. Taylor completely sagged. His points after two shots were zero. The ball served by Taylor flew for the third time. Smith called the situation a strike and as if nothing had happened, he caught the ball. At this point, the warm-up ended, and the guy was about to leave the field, since it looked like he was completely out of shape. Coach Smith approached the guy and offered to train with his players, the Eagles team. Taking pity on the guy, he explained to Taylor that his ball control and aiming were very good, but his speed left much to be desired. Leaving the field, Smith clearly knew that this guy would not pass the selection. He was too slow, and such people were not needed on the team. Boss Mason was also not happy with Taylor's achievements, 
and realized that he had apparently gotten carried away by choosing him for the game. Completely upset, Taylor left the stadium and certainly forever. He had not shown with his skills before. And after the injury, they could not even be called professional. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho appeared nearby. He was flying and sharing his impressions of the warm-up he had seen. The ghost decided to tell Taylor that his serve today was not so bad, because it was his first throw after a six-year break. Kim explained that any coach wants to see a player's talent that could be developed to a professional level, and their success depended on this. He then pointed out to Taylor his first big problem, being short. And finally, he convinced the guy that in baseball you can use everything you have, even your small stature. Taylor thought maybe he really had talent because today he nullified all his innings. After such thoughts, a light and shy smile ran across his lips. At that moment, the ghost of Kim Jin-ho called out to the guy, changing his mind about disappearing. Stretching his index finger forward, he pointed it towards the stadium, where the guys from the Eagles team were coming out for training. Taylor's curious gaze rushed to the place where Kim Jin-ho's flying ghost was pointing. The baseball guys had strange symbols spinning above their heads. 2R, 3R, 4R. What could it be? Taylor wondered. And then he understood everything. It was the player's rating, the points scored during the games. The ghost invited Taylor to play with these guys, and he would probably be able to score the same points. It was not for nothing that he activated the roulette. Taylor dove into the calculations. A spin of the roulette cost 1,000 points, so he needed to make 254 point shots. It turns out that he could spin the roulette once every four months, and that was a very, very long time. While they were both reasoning and making calculations, a dark male figure appeared on the horizon. He was good looking, tall, physically developed, and above his head was the number 100R, which was his record for points scored. The sun was high, the game was taking place on the field, the same one for which Taylor came to the stadium, the Eagles team was playing with the Tigers team, it was a kind of selection of players. Taylor played as a pitcher for the Tigers, and was invited by President Mason to pitch. The guy who was the batter on the Eagles team was a slugger. He hit so hard that the ball went out of bounds, called a home run. The duel between pitcher and batter was the center of attention. These were the most spectacular moments of the game. Boss Mason was jubilant. Taylor hit three home runs in a row, and the Tigers announced a replacement. The batter from the Eagles team wondered how this kid, after such a long break, could serve balls so deftly. Mason watched the game, and meanwhile, the referee announced a substitution for the Soul Angels. Coach Orloff made a decision, and an almost professional entered the game. The same guy with a rating of 100 points. Mason was sweating and nervous. He knew and saw this player firsthand. Sitting on the bench behind the player counter, Taylor was also nervous. Boss Mason looked at Taylor with a devouring gaze. His fate was decided. It's good that Kim's ghost was nearby. Examining the hundred-point guy, Kim immediately saw with his experienced eye the makings of a professional. The 100-point record holder of the Orly team walked out with a confident gait and even rushed onto the field. It was strange everyone around them thought that such a smart player was in a public baseball club. The record holder approached his comrades and greeted them. He thanked the coach for his care and second chance after injury and rehabilitation. Manager Orlov wanted this guy to make it to the pros. He was addicted to money and this player could bring quite a lot into his piggy bank. Having told the coach that by becoming a professional, he would get back all the money he had spent, he went out onto the field. Taylor, at that moment, was squatting in the corner behind the player's counter, praying. He had never been so scared. Seeing a ghost turned out to be an easier task than the upcoming game with a hundred-point guy. The record holder's name was Wilson Miller, and Taylor would have to fight him fair and square. Wilson was confident and calm. Looking at the Tigers pitcher, he already considered himself a winner. The game continued. The teams alternated between playing defense and attack, with the Soul Angels losing to the Tigers by one point. Tigers pitcher Taylor didn't give up as he threw his next pitch. The Tigers were leading, and he was very happy about this. Having received three blows in a row, Wilson was sent off for the time being. Without a 100-point leader, the Eagles players were confused and unsure of their game. They yelled at their batter to stay focused on the ball until it was Wilson's turn, then they would definitely have a chance to win. Shouting over each other, they advised how to stall for time in the current situation. Having made a rapid throw, the ball launched by the Tigers pitcher fell into the catcher's trap, and so on three times. Mason was furious. How could he throw three balls in a row? It's an out, he yelled at his player. At this time, Wilson Miller came onto the field with a baseball bat in his hands. The Eagles team went on the attack and were eager to score points. Boss Mason, Taylor, and the flying ghost glared at the guy. In their eyes, he looked like a baseball monster. Coach Orloff put the same person on the field for the fourth time in a row, which made Mason indignant, and his millions were at risk. 
he barked at Taylor and told him to take the field as Tirgov's pitcher one more time. Taylor went to join the game, but Mason still did not let up. Only threats were heard behind him. The guy took a position in the circle to serve, his hundred-point opponent pierced with a murderous gaze. He didn't know what to do and asked for at least some light from the ghost of Kim Jin-ho. But the master of Major League Baseball, the ghost of Kim Jin-ho, left the guy without his advice. Taylor did not have the skills of the pros. He did not throw curveballs, pitches, or fly balls. The guy served the ball while simultaneously discussing what to do. Surprisingly, the pitch was successful, and the ball was caught by his teammate's catcher. The throw turned out to be better than everyone expected. A roar was heard from the stands, and people around began to wonder who the pitcher was. President Mason, sitting on the podium, kept his fists for his team and more for his money. Feeling how good it was to be successful, Taylor shared his feeling with a ghost flying nearby, and there was a booth on the field and Kim decided to give the guy some good advice, inviting Taylor to test his new virtual roulette skill. Remembering yesterday's events, Taylor looked at him with a questioning look. When the guy started the roulette, it spun until it stopped completely for several minutes, emitting a bright light. Opening his eyes slightly, he tried to get used to the bright light and looked at the glowing drum. On one of the cells of the roulette reel, there was a message that the guy had access to the skill of intellectual revolution. Remembering last night and the events of what happened, Taylor looked towards Orlov's opponent, who was discussing something with the referee. The guy made the final decision to test his roulette bonus, assuming that there would be no better place to test it. A message appeared from the system manager that the bonus will be used taking into account a crisis situation when the bases are loaded with one out. The next message from the system manager offered to knock out the batter from the game and receive an additional reward. While Taylor carefully studied the proposed options, Kim hung in the air, watching the changing pictures on the screen. The last message stated that all earned points were reset. The guy wanted to take full advantage of this, and if Wilson Miller hit a couple more home runs, he would just have to change his partner. Taylor knew he was playing with one advantage in this match, as Wilson had seen him play for the first time today. The main character pushed off the plate with his foot, felt stability, bent his arm at the elbow and swung to throw. Having prepared himself in advance, Wilson watched the Tigers pitcher's every move. The ball was already flying towards Miller. And at this time, Taylor was thinking about how to gain time and prevent the opponent from getting used to his serves. This time, Wilson missed and the Tigers catcher caught the ball. The game continued and the referee ordered a strike. Wilson Miller thought about it. He had a feeling that the speed of the ball was 100 kilometers per hour. The Eagles players and their coach watched the game and thought that this was just a tactical move by the batter. But Wilson himself understood that this guy Taylor was not so simple and the situation could become a failure. Analyzing his opponent's every move, Miller concluded that there was something about this pitcher that set him apart from the others. Deciding that it was not time to panic, the batter prepared to take the serve one more time. The ghost of Kim, predicting Wilson's plan of action, pestered Taylor with his chatter as he prepared to throw. Batter Wilson was determined, as if he was going to fly into space on a baseball bat. After looking at his opponent and thinking a little, Kim suggested that Taylor listen to another recommendation. Laughing jokingly, he advised playing baseball with all your heart, or better yet, with your kidneys. Time passed. Kim was chattering. Wilson was on fire with anticipation of the throw, and Taylor was afraid of getting a warning from the referee. The ghost flew through the sky and continued to chatter about how Taylor was unlucky with his height and serving high was not his strong point. As a result, Kim concluded that the guy's affected area is as small as his height. Snarling at the ghost, who had tired him out with his chatter, the guy offended Kim unaware of the consequences. Kim, as always, turned out to be right, and this time is no exception. All of Taylor's balls will be hit. The main character decided that he needed to try the skill. There was no other way out. He would either lose, or the skill would help him. Intellectual revolution. Taylor said these two words, and something immediately changed in his gaze. He looked at the stadium. Everything was as usual. He looked at the sky. It was clear and still sunny. The inscription lit up on the virtual screen. Your intellectual revolution skill is activated. You can throw the ball in any direction. Kim Jinho was reading the message. And meanwhile, Taylor saw a thing very similar to the skill from the game. The guy looked at manager Smith. Now on the field, Smith was a catcher and was waiting for a throw from his team's pitcher. The strange mark on Chief Smith's gauntlet glowed like a sight as if it followed Taylor when he moved his eyes. Kim Jinho suggested that there would be no better time to test the acquired skill and suggested that they quickly throw the ball. Taylor took his place in the serving circle and took the correct stance. The mark on Smith's mitt continued to glow. It's time to check the probability of a hit on the roulette, and what are its possibilities now, the guy thought. The right-handed batter Wilson was very accurate. He hit all the balls, 
even if they flew several in a row, but there were also successful landing zones. It was precisely this area that Taylor was aiming for, pushing off and swinging for a throw. The ball flew towards the luminous mark at breakneck speed. In Taylor's head, real pictures were replaced with unreal ones, and he was completely confused in them. Wilson took a comfortable, stable stance and locked his eyes on the flying ball, bat poised above his head. He made the best effort he could and swung it, but the bat flew past the ball. Catcher Smith caught the ball safely with his trap, and the umpire called a strike. The team and coach Orloff sent the referee to the floor, shouting from their seats. The stadium turned into a booth. Boss Mason and the Tiger Boys were jubilant. It was a small step towards victory. One more point, just one, and we will win, thought the main character, remaining in the circle to serve. It was not a hallucination, but a very real reality. Taylor figured out the images running in his head. Looking at the flight path, the guy realized that the ball was flying at the exact course, centimeter to centimeter, and it was heavier than before the throw. The sudden appearance of baseball roulette and this intellectual reality skill worked, and the advice of the flying chatty man in a cap, who also happens to be the ghost of baseball legend Kim Jinho, also worked. The game continued. The situation in the stadium became more tense. Each team expected a positive outcome, each for itself. Taylor became very self-confident. He extended his hand towards the opponent and threatened Wilson to control the ball. Blinded by his luck, he decided that he would throw another exactly the same ball and score a strike for his opponents. The guy was about to set the same flight course, but a ghost flying nearby did not allow the guy to concentrate. Kim teased the boy with his chatter and ridicule. Taylor was angry. He expected support from his flying friend, but he was not going to cheer him up. Having not received Kim's support, Taylor began to prepare himself for a throw. A skill that of course is good to use, but suddenly something goes wrong. A transformer of consciousness, Taylor said just two words and something changed in his gaze again. Taking his position and taking the ball in his hand to serve, he prepared to throw. Taylor, of course, saw the luminous mark and aimed exactly at it, centimeter by centimeter. Making a swift turn, he swung, and the powerful ball rushed like crazy with unbridled speed. As the ball flew toward the target, the luminous mark moved with catcher Smith. Convinced that everything was fine, Taylor confidently prepared for the upcoming strike. But it was not to be. Batter Wilson struck the ball and hit it. Crouching in surprise, Taylor saw the ball flying out of the playing field. The referee declared a foul on Wilson because his action was contrary to the laws of the game. The team managers were worried. They each supported their own interests and their millions. The game was gaining new momentum, and Batter Wilson, pondering the pitcher's throw, began to think that something was wrong with this guy. Reviewing Taylor's abilities, he recognized his courage and thoughtful tactical actions. Taylor trained his ball to throw it high and catch it immediately, and it didn't look like it was very malleable. Seeing a fairly slow flying ball, Wilson could not find the right moment to hit it, and he decided that no matter how hard Taylor tried to push him into a corner, he would not give up because he was the best batter on this field. For six years, Taylor had not experienced such sports excitement. For six long years, he had not felt such excellent physical activity. He looked into the eyes of his opponent. His gaze pierced as if with a laser. The energy was mesmerizing. Even at a distance, one could feel the power. The guy drooped and almost cried. A feeling of fear rolled over him like a huge wall. He begged the ghost of Kim to suggest at least something. Having outlined his options for the outcome of the game, Kim Jinho suggested that the strategies were over and the batter would return all serves with a direct hit. Another problem was the guy's speed. And the second was that nothing can be changed, you just need to take the ball and hit it. The third problem is the unwillingness to fight, and if you don't have it, then you have to leave, saying that you can't throw the ball and run from the field in tears. Finally, Kim suggested that the guy turn on his brains using his head, after which he laughed out loud. Standing on the pitcher's mound and digesting the ghost's advice, Taylor decided to throw the ball in the best possible way. But the only way to counter a monster like Wilson Miller is to use maximum speed. Taylor knew that his speed level was 100 kilometers per hour, and this was the maximum possible. The only hope left was for a sure shot. Taking off with his foot from the bar in the center of the circle, Taylor swung as hard as he could and made a throw. Wilson Miller, his eyes fixed on the flying ball, prepared to hit it. The baseball was flying toward the batter but it was difficult to predict the speed of the flight path. Focusing on the target, Wilson swung the bat, whizzing through the air without hitting the ball. Horror froze in his eyes. He missed, not even realizing how this could happen. The deflected ball flew into the trap of manager Smith's catcher, near the ground. Wilson's bat flew over the target. The game developed according to some other scenario. The Eagles team, led by their coach, were in a daze. Watching the outcome of the game, 
and the hope of victory was fading before their eyes. The umpire watched every movement of the players with passion as the Tigers catcher caught the ball over and over again. Watching the Tigers guys, manager Mason could not utter a word. Everyone was waiting. Suddenly, the ghost of Kim shouted Taylor's name. He was going to tell the guy something. Having finished shouting, he whispered in his ear that it was necessary to attack third base. Taylor immediately yelled at the top of his lungs at Coach Smith to throw the caught ball to third base. Anticipating this situation, Manager Orlov ordered his runners to run to third base. Coach Smith understood everything, and taking the ball more conveniently, he threw it to the third baseman of his team. The Tigers baseball player ran toward the flying ball, running across his opponents. Having deftly caught the ball in his trap, the Tigers runner emerged victorious from the situation. At this point, the referee announced that the game was over, not believing his eyes that it was all over. Taylor continued to stand on the pitcher's mound. The guys from the Tigers team rushed onto the field, it was wild jubilation. They thanked Taylor for this victory. Very upset by the result, the batter from the Eagles team left the field defeated. The guys from the Tigers congratulated Taylor on a bright and worthy victory, and the guy was glowing with happiness. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho looked at the guys with pleasure. Once upon a time, he experienced such feelings for the first time. At the exit from the stadium, a glowing screen appeared before Taylor's eyes with the inscription that he had earned another bronze roulette. Kim's indignation knew no bounds. He did not want to understand how he could get all these points and bonuses by winning just once. The coolest and happiest day had come in Taylor's life. He had dreamed about this all his life and rejoiced like a boy. Meanwhile, in a city in the south of the country, an independent team of the Stars of the Motherland was training at a baseball stadium. The coaches of the Stars of the Motherland were preparing their independent team for the next match. The team had excellent players, selected ones. Their training was one step away from professionals. A black SUV with tinted windows stopped in the stadium parking lot. Homeland Stars director Chuck Byamsok and coach John Jung were waiting outside for the guests to arrive. Or rather, a guest. The team leader of the professional team Angels of Soul Soul, her name was Jessica. Director Chuck, speaking first, thanked her for the meeting, very surprised at such a sudden visit. Jessica replied that she stopped by while passing through. She had some business to do on the way and wasn't going to stay long. The guest was only interested in one question. Where was the player Wilson Miller and why was he not on the field? Coach John replied that Miller had a game today at a public stadium and would be gone for a while and dialed Wilson's phone number. When Coach John got through, he asked how the game went. But in response, he heard that he had lost three home runs in a row and hit a swing. Director Chuck and the guest, standing at a distance, listened to the telephone conversation. They realized that something had happened. Apparently something interesting happened. The guest concluded, and suggested discussing the details of a training game with the Angels in February. Jessica asked the director of the Homeland Stars to allow player Wilson Miller to start playing that day. Having finished the conversation, she took her leave and hurried to the car. As the managers watched the guest go, they discussed among themselves their increased interest in Wilson. Jessica rushed down the road, realizing that Seoul Angels sponsor Seoul Hyun Sung was in a hurry. She did not come by chance. She was sent by the owner of the Angels of Soul Soul, having fallen ill quite recently. He was afraid of not having time to see the victories of his team. So, the game ended. The sun set below the horizon over the public stadium. Dusk fell, and all the guys went their separate ways. Wilson Miller's baseball bat lay in pieces on the floor. He himself sat alone, upset in the trash and mentally drawing an end to his career as a professional. After a phone call with Coach John, sweat and tears rolled down his face. Meanwhile, Somewhere on the outskirts of the city, the Tigers team was celebrating their victory in some dingy bar. The guys poured glasses full, alcohol flowed like a river. Today he is the best among all the others. The next morning came, the city was awakening from sleep. Taylor dragged himself half asleep down the street. He was in no mood at all, Kim Jin Ho tried to cheer him up, but to no avail. The main character went to work early in the morning, and Kim Jin Ho persuaded the guy to go play baseball. The Phantom did not understand why Taylor needed to work when he had a baseball manager in his hands. Kim got angry, realizing that the guy did not want to listen to his arguments. Taylor couldn't quit his job. His family had almost no means of livelihood left. He couldn't tell them that he suddenly wanted to play baseball. Kim teased the guy, mockingly offered the guy to cry and then help him wipe away his tears. Having closed the topic of conversation, Taylor hurried up and suggested that Kim should catch up with him. Or stay. Taylor walked the rest of the way, lost in his thoughts. He didn't even notice how Kim caught up with him, and they both found themselves in front of the gates of the factory building where he worked. They went inside, the factory resembled an abandoned room, more like a huge hangar. 
Taylor was walking down the corridor when someone put a hand on his shoulder. These were the guys with whom he played on the same team yesterday, and with whom he had fun all evening after the game. While they were laughing and discussing their achievements from the day before, the production manager appeared behind them. He crept up unnoticed and angrily asked why everyone was having fun and not getting to work. Having threatened with dismissal, the guys fled to take their jobs. He continued to be sarcastic, asking how the great pitcher who deigned to come to work today was doing. The production manager ordered Taylor not to begin his share of the work, pointing his finger at the cutting machine. Taylor looked in horror at the machine with a huge blade and realized that this was his place of work for today. After apologizing to the boss for his lack of experience with the cutter, he asked for another job. The boss, throwing his gloves in the guy's face, sent him to take his place at the machine. Stop whining. Go to work and show your skill and skill here. Yesterday you jumped on the field, jump here too, he said zealously. The boss left furious. On the way he attacked the guys like an angry dog. Everything infuriated him. There was nothing to do, Taylor thought. He would have to work on the cutter and began to inspect the machine, but could not find the power button. The guy's mood was at zero, it was pouring rain outside, and it was cloudy all day. Taylor put on a protective mask and gloves, turned on the machine and got to work. He had to cut accurately and accurately. The ghost of Kim came down from somewhere from heaven. He called the guy a weakling and explained that the pitcher's position is always an attacker. The boy was sad. Without looking up from his work, he answered Kim that such is life in society and you always have to endure, even if it's hard. Taylor looked at the cutter with all his eyes. He had not slept at all after yesterday. A scream was suddenly heard from the upper tier of the factory. The floor around the cutter was splattered with drops of blood. All the workers ran to this cry. Boss Mason went to Taylor, not understanding why he had to use the shredder. The guy was sitting crumpled on the floor and clutching the wound on his left hand. Blood was gushing out of it. The boss, thinking that he would get hurt, trembled with fear, because it was he who ordered the boy to work on the cutter. The wound was not very deep. The blade passed exactly between the thumb and forefinger. Boss Mason looked worriedly at the guy's hand to see if he had cut it off completely. One of the guys suggested that we urgently need to take him to the hospital. Ten minutes earlier, Boss Mason had concluded that the wound was not serious and barked that he needed to be careful with cutting machines. He was haunted by the question of why Taylor was so sleepy and even went to the chopper. The boss was right there. Everything can be attributed to the state of the guy who played baseball and now sleeps at work. Having stopped the performance, Boss Mason ordered everyone to go to their jobs. The production manager, worried about his ass, returned to his office, relieved. Taylor was left sitting on the floor with a wounded arm. No one took him to the hospital. After work, he wandered the streets for a long time, past houses and shops. He didn't want to return home at all. Time passed. It quickly became dark outside. Twilight set in, and only a month illuminated the small house on the roof. At home, Taylor treated and bandaged his wounded hand himself. It was late, but I didn't want to sleep at all. The guy was sitting on the bed and suddenly his gaze fell on a baseball lying on the floor in the middle of the room. Examining his right hand under the rays of bright light, he became worried that it would happen if he injured his right hand or, worse, cut it off. Cursing at the production manager and the damn job, he remembered Kim's words about how to stand up for yourself. Covering his eyes with his palm, Taylor was upset. He no longer played baseball and his hands apparently would not be useful to him. Minute after minute passed, Taylor continued to lie on the bed. The ghost of Kim Jinho was nearby and watched the boy. Having called the guy by name several times, he shuddered in surprise and Kim asked how long he was going to lie there and look at one point. Without moving from his place, the boy answered Kim in a depressed voice that he had nothing to do and that he was not considering the offer to leave the factory. The phone rang. Taylor struggled to get out of bed, but had no intention of answering the phone. Dad, an incoming call was displayed on the phone. Only a father could call at such a late time, the boy thought. Taylor silently looked at the screen. The phone continued to ring, and Kim did not understand why the guy was not answering. The guy didn't want to answer. He didn't want to upset his father. When he heard this, Kim got angry because he trained him to be strong and brave. Taylor pulled himself together, pressed the phone button and said, Hi, Dad. The father asked how the game went on Sunday, and for Taylor this was the main question. He talked non-stop to his father about strikes, pitches, and a monster batter. Kim Jinho, listening to their conversation, realized that the most important thing in a boy's life is baseball, and only baseball. It was almost 3 o'clock in the morning, and the guy was chatting and chatting with his father about baseball. Suddenly Taylor's father asked if he knew Uncle Jim, who lived above them, and expressed his intention to work with him starting next month. 
At that time, my father was sitting on an unrolled mattress in the middle of the room and looking at an open magazine lying on the floor. He talked into the phone for a long time that he couldn't sit around without work all the time and that Taylor didn't need to worry about them anymore. It was all for a reason. It was at that moment that my father was reading an article about how the player Taylor and his team won the match on Sunday. Dad was in rehabilitation and did mom know that he decided to work? He's not completely healthy yet, Taylor was worried. The father said that his son should live for himself and do what he loves and he himself will take care of the family. Taylor remembered that fateful day when he was informed that his father was taken by ambulance to the hospital. The news was like a bolt from the blue. The boy broke from training and immediately rushed to the hospital. His mother and sister were already there. They were sobbing over his father's bed. Dad had a heart attack. He lay connected to an artificial respiration apparatus. Doctors did not give any prognosis. Taylor was still just a boy. A teenager, fear crept into his eyes from what he saw. His father was the only breadwinner in the family. I had to forget about baseball and training. Now Taylor was the head of the family. He must help his loved ones. That's how the guy ended up at the factory, where he still worked from morning to late evening. He worked hard, carried out all the orders of his boss. At the factory they fed him lunch, but they paid him a pittance, which was barely enough to make ends meet. Taylor's free lunch was also not varied, like other workers. He was given a carton of milk and one bun, and so on every day. The guy had lunch, and watched baseball on TV. Now this was the only way he could watch the game. He no longer had time to visit the stadium. During lunch, he sat in a secluded place and enthusiastically followed each game, his personal dream becoming more and more distant. A telephone conversation brought Taylor back to reality. His father told him that his son should do what he likes. Kim followed the conversation closely. He agreed with his father. The guy had a great desire to play baseball. The father regretted that he realized his son's desire so late, and Taylor's words made tears flow from his eyes. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho once again tried to hook Taylor, calling him a whiny baby. Get out of here! Why the hell are you coming here? In the middle of the dark night, Taylor was screaming at the top of his lungs, so much so that he could be heard on the next street. The night ended as quickly as it came, and early in the morning the guy went to the factory. Voices were heard from Mason's boss's office. He was talking with the production manager. They were discussing Sunday's game. The production manager was a sycophant, and a sycophant, jumping like a grasshopper on its hind legs just to please the boss. Approaching the office door, Taylor kicked it down, so much so that the boss and boss screamed in fear. Mason called Taylor crazy and yelled, how dare he burst in here without an invitation. The production manager chimed in nearby. Taylor put his hand in the left breast pocket of his jacket, fidgeted there for a long time, then took it out and took a baseball pitcher's stance. While the boss and the production manager were wondering what was happening, a throw was made from the guy's hands in their direction. Mason thought it was a baseball flying, fearing that it would kill him and began to cover his face with his hands. It was not a ball, it was a sheet of paper folded in four, the boss realized when the paper flew into his face. The president of the company, Mason, was sweating beyond belief. He was very scared and did not expect such an act from Taylor. A piece of paper fell on the table and lay in front of the eyes of the boss and supervisor. It was a letter of resignation. Having called Taylor a moron, the boss and boss shouted in both voices that no one would need him and would die without work. Taylor stood in the middle of the office, completely unperturbed. He did not care deeply about the words spoken. Kim hung behind the guy and happily twisted the figure from his fingers while he mockingly asked to prepare his severance pay. Two months passed from the moment Taylor left the factory. He immediately applied for selection to an independent baseball team. And that day came. Guys, the candidates were diligently warming up at the stadium. Some ran long distances, did endurance jumps, and stretched. Others practiced throwing for pitches and their ability to wield a baseball bat and ball, all preparing for tackling. Taylor is no exception. He was right there at the stadium among the other guys of the candidates doing his stretching. When the start of the competition was announced, the ghost of Kim Jin-ho, as always, was next to the guy. Continuing to warm up, he suggested that he was unlikely to pass the selection, since it was too difficult and there were too many applicants. Kim was indignant, because Taylor had been running and stretching every morning for two months, and passing the standards would not be that difficult. The guy really had a strict routine every day. He ate, rested, watched baseball, and went back to training. Then he ran again, stretched, trained, and Kim was always there, and after that he was still unsure of the selection. The ghost inquired about the guy's mood. He had reasons for forcing Taylor to do all this day after day. He had to understand baseball better, Looking into the baseball manager, the guy saw how his speed and endurance improved. Taylor looked at the glowing screen until the stadium announced, 
everyone's attention. The judge ordered everyone to gather in the center of the stadium. The selection for the Motherland Stars team began right now. Among all the independent teams, the Homeland Stars were the closest to a professional level team, playing against second tier professional teams every year. Last year, they produced three professional players, including a standout batter who played for a team that went pro. And today, Taylor came to the audition for the Stars of the Motherland, stood lined up in the middle of the stadium, next to the other guys with the same dream. The guy knew that he was here for a reason. He was here to take the first step, one step towards professional sports. The referee blew his whistle and announced the end of the endurance test. The match will start soon. Check out the list of teams and names and wait for your turn, the referee continued to announce. At the first test, Taylor tried very hard. He asked Kim, who was carefully watching the players, if he had failed this round. Kim Jinho mercilessly replied that compared to others, the boy lacks physical fitness. And at this time, the coach of the Stars of the Motherland came onto the field. He had to make an important statement. John Jonk, the Homeland Stars pitching coach, greeted everyone, saying that he would be leading the blue team and asked them to follow the instructions. He further said that he would name the names in the order in which he would like to arrange the candidates for selection. Looking at the list, the coach asked if any of the participants would like to be the first to enter the field on their own. The guys sat there, their eyes fixed on the floor like mice. It's a lot of pressure to be the first on the pitcher's mound. Nobody wanted to be first on the list, especially if you didn't know who you were going to play against. If only it wasn't me, the applicants prayed, while Coach John examined each one with his piercing gaze. Taylor stood up from his seat and extended his hand upward, indicating himself to the coach. He decided to be first. Having praised the guy, Kim Jinho was very happy about this action. He taught that the pitcher should be the first in everything. Taylor walked onto the field with a confident gait. He had nothing to lose, but maybe he had something to show. Calling out to the guy, the ghost stopped Taylor and asked him to remember all the advice he once gave. The team stood on the field in their places. Taylor took the pitching circle on the pitcher's mound. The game was about to start any minute. Kim once again reminded of his lessons, since the guy did not excel in either speed, serve, or physique. While the activated baseball manager provided information about the current bonuses, Taylor prepared himself. The judge shouted loudly for the next test to begin. The white team's batter, Ben Tabos, stood with his bat at the ready and had a rating of 37, according to the baseball manager. Tabos was not afraid of Taylor. From his training days, all he could remember of his achievements were slow serves and a pretentious stance. This is not an opponent, the batter flashed in his head. He decided that he would cut all the pitches and tease Taylor as much as possible. While the batter was painting his victory in bright colors, the Blues pitcher threw the first pitch. Ben swung at the ball and didn't even try to hit it. The ball was safely trapped by the blue team's catcher. When the umpire called a strike, the batter stood there dumbfounded. He could have easily returned this serve. It was shameful to stand just like that at the selection of the stars of Koyan's homeland. Taylor decided that this was a joke or that the batter was teasing him and prepared for the second serve. Gritting his teeth, Ben concentrated on the game, waiting for another throw from the Blues pitcher. Taylor calmly repeated the previous serve, throwing along the same trajectory. The ball was rapidly approaching the batter's square, but Ben jumped to the side in horror, not understanding where the ball was flying. The referee called out, and Ben Tabos was forced to go to the bench to wait his turn in the game. A ghost appeared next to Taylor and immediately quipped that it was the pitcher who threw a terrible pitch and not the batter who retreated from the hit. Meanwhile, the second batter of the white team was brought onto the field. The glowing screen showed his rating of 33 points. Coach John Jong was diligently taking notes on his tablet, preparing for the next pitch and the next batter. Taylor continued to throw the same pitches. The blue team's catcher used a secret sign to show Taylor which corner to throw to. The second batter raised his bat over his head. Having examined the pitcher on the first pitches, he concluded that there was no speed and there was nothing to be afraid of. Taking off and throwing the ball, Taylor watched as it quickly flew into the zone. The new batter also missed, and again the blue team's catcher caught the ball. The referee called out again, and the upset batter of the white team went to the bench to stand by. Taylor rejoiced. He managed to make two consecutive batters outs, so the glowing screen announced that 33 points were credited to his account. Enjoying the results obtained, the main character mentally praised himself. He would throw the ball in the air with his right hand, catch it and realize that his serves were smooth and his fingers were more sensitive to the ball. But the repertoire was far from complete, Taylor convinced himself, looking at the field. The third batter of the white team came out to home base, the so-called house in baseball. His rating was 50, the virtual baseball screen reported. Taking his position, the batter, having watched the previous pitches of the Blues pitcher, was convinced that he had a lousy player in front of him. The 50-pointer recalled his fellow batter, 
who was unable to predict Taylor's throw and therefore missed. Meanwhile, Taylor was already serving, his next slow serve. The third pitcher, imagining the trajectory of the ball, aimed the ball with a baseball bat. Watching the ball fly away towards his opponent, Taylor wondered what he was thinking about now. The batter's timing was off, and the ball coming his way missed the bat. Having missed, it dawned on him that this was a change-up, and he became even more upset. Taylor did it. He sent all three batters to the bench in quick succession for the first time. Emotions were overwhelming. The virtual screen displayed message after message about the bonuses earned. The sun was high, the sky was clear and partly cloudy, the day was in full swing. Three batters blew against a lousy pitcher, slow as a turtle, who wasn't even tall enough as he left the field, Taylor thought. Sitting on the podium, baseball experts commented on the selection stage that had passed. They did not consider a single worthy applicant. While regretting wasted time, some of the judges were surprised at the candidate's complete lack of potential. Only one of the experts carefully examined the small pitcher, studying his characteristics. Strongly doubting, he concluded that the slow pitcher's mask was apparently the only weapon for this baby's survival. Looking at his list, and once again remembering the throws of Pritchard Taylor, the expert made sure that this was his limit. Taylor left the field. He was heading to the exit, the coach of the Stars of the Motherland, with his arms crossed on his chest, stood at a distance and watched the main character, thoughtful. John Jonk looked at Taylor and assumed that he was faced with a rare breed of pitchers. The coach appreciated his change-up skills and nerves of steel, but he was embarrassed by the guy's low speed. Having thought that nerves of steel would not help one become a professional at a speed of 120 kilometers per hour, John stopped considering his candidacy. While the Homeland Stars coach was lost in his thoughts about Challenger Taylor, someone called out to him. It was the director of the Homeland Stars, Chuck Biomsiak. He was walking towards the coach, with his tablet in his hand, full of notes. The director needed to talk to Coach John without delay. Chuck Bayomsiak was a very competent and wise leader. He never made hasty conclusions, and always weighed his decisions. Interested in pitcher Taylor, the director suggested testing the guy in the third inning, the so-called period of the match. The selection for the independent team of Stars of the Motherland continued, and Taylor, having completed the next test, was going home. Let's return to the events of two months ago, on the day when the main character quit his job, and it was deep night. The guy came home, collapsed on the bed without undressing, and said with regret in his voice that he was unemployed. Immediately the ghost of Kim Jin-ho appeared. Lately he had been doing this suddenly, and said that the guy shouldn't worry about this. He reminded us that there was one bronze roulette bonus and suggested using it. The ghost chatted about how to stop lying around and that there was a lot of work ahead, and Taylor listened attentively and was silent. Suddenly the guy perked up and, waving his hand, said that he would try the bronze roulette once again. Taylor spun the bronze drum with all his might. It flashed with bright light and spun. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho followed with his eyes the turns of the roulette that blinded him. Taylor rose from the bed. He also sat waiting for the dropped cell while yellow rays pierced the room and filled it with light. The roulette stopped while Kim was babbling something incomprehensible. Taylor was reading a message from the virtual screen. It was reported about a new skill strengthening the twisted serve, which really confused the guy. He was not happy. Wondering how to master Kever, he began to study his characteristics in a baseball manager. Silence reigned in the room. Kim hung in the air in his thoughts and Taylor thought, sitting on the bed. Suddenly laughing, the ghost broke the silence. He considered worries about characteristics to be sheer nonsense. They discussed tactics and action plans together for a long time, but everything came down to the low speed of the ball. In the end, Kim hinted to the guy that there was only one weapon and it was his shitty throws. With every word Kim said, Taylor became more and more upset because in essence it turns out that he is a shitty pitcher. Player Taylor, hearing his last name, woke up the guy, immersed in memories of two months ago. He was brought back to reality by coach John Junk, who quietly approached Taylor and offered to play in the third inning. It was unexpected, the boy's eyes lit up with joy, and a slight smile appeared on his lips. For Taylor, the selection was not over yet. Everyone was assembled, the Motherland Stars team took their places on the benches, and the coach and experts carefully watched what was happening. Taylor entered the field, positioned himself in a circle, and prepared for the important moment. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho hovered in the clouds and encouraged the guy in his insidious style, motivating him to surpass himself. The referee gave the command, let's play, and the players took their positions on the playing field. Taylor realized that he had to act. He looked intently into the eyes of his team's catcher and put two fingers of his right hand on his left shoulder. This encrypted signal was called a curve, and the catcher, understanding the pitcher's secret gesture, prepared to throw a curveball. 
Taylor placed his fingers along the seams of the ball in a narrow place and twisted it quietly, hoping for a correctly understood signal. The batter stood ready. He also saw the secret signal, but did not understand its meaning. Taylor pushed off in the circle and threw his curve, slowly twisting the serve. When the batter realized that the secret sign meant a curve, the catcher, diving in front of the batter's bat, caught the ball. He quickly tossed the ball back into Taylor's hands, who served his second serve with another curve. As the ball approached home plate, the batter missed again, deciding at the last second to change the position of his bat. He was completely confused and could not immediately determine the pitches, doubting between the cover and the slider. Calming himself, he decided that the small pitcher did not control the ball at all, and all his pitches were pure accidents. It was the low speed of the ball that confused the batter and his thoughts became fixated only on change-up serves. The referee ordered the game to continue, and the white batter took a stance, preparing to hit the change-up pitcher. Hoping that it would be very easy to cope with, he tuned in to the serves of an inexperienced beginner. Throwing his signature change-up, Taylor had no doubt about his abilities. When the guy pitched the baseball, he glared at it as it flew toward home plate. It really was a change-up, skillfully presented by Taylor. The batter skillfully twisted, brought his elbows inside his body and hit the ball. Having hit it, he raised his eyes to the sky, watching the flying ball. Coach John Jonk quickly made some notes on his tablet, recording all the techniques used in the game. Blinded by the bright sun, the batter continued to look at the sky, looking for the ball as it flew off the playing field. Taylor was triumphant. Everything happened as he had planned. Watching the game, Kim did not hide the pleasure he received. But he was not going to praise the guy. The selection was not over yet. Taylor turned to his ghost friend. He was right again. He only used one weapon on this field. And it's a change-up, a shitty Taylor change-up, a pitch from a shitty little pitcher. The referee called out. Coach John Jonk carefully studied his tablet. He was very interested in this pitcher. The world of competition is strange and mysterious. There are definitely things in it that cannot be explained through theories, the coach thought, remembering the guy's pretentious poses. For example, during a match, a player comes face to face with a tough, strong opponent. And suddenly there are moments when, competing with each other for the first time, you think that he is stronger. Even before the start of the match, the thought of leadership arises, and as the game progresses, everything feels possible, be it victory or defeat. And at the moment when victory becomes a reality, and the winner is not the one who seemed many times stronger, it defies any common sense, the coach concluded. While Taylor was basking in the glow of the victorious tournament, the blue screen was showered with points and bonuses. The reward was one silver roulette ticket. The stadium was empty, everyone had left, and in the office of the director of the Rodina Stars team, heated negotiations and arguments were taking place. Experts gathered to discuss the selection results. They had to make an important decision. Many of them believed that there were no worthy candidates, even if it was just a selection for an independent team. Coach John Jong raised his hand and asked to speak. He put forward the theory that there are no other pitchers worthy of attention. He suggested considering the candidacy of pitcher Taylor, who deliberately hid his abilities. Having shown himself in the third inning, the guy was able to dominate the batters, the coach continued. Looking at his tablet with notes, John Jonk read aloud Taylor's characteristics. The coach believed that the guy was very capable and could definitely reach the level of a professional. Looking at the director sitting next to him, John Jonk wondered if he thought the same thing. Homeland Star director Chuck Bomsom entered the conversation and offered to take Taylor onto the team and test him again. It was decided to test the guy at the end of February, during the next game against the Blue Dragons and Taylor would be the opening pitcher. Concluding his speech, the director knew that it would not be a big risk for the stars of the motherland to send an unknown player to the field. This time the night was longer and blacker than a cloud. Taylor's fate was decided. The selection for the stars of the motherland was over, but he could not sleep. It's not ringing, the guy thought, staring at the phone. He beat three batters, but the phone didn't ring. Kim reassured the guy. He asked him not to worry so much, and if they didn't call, there would be a chance to try next time. Put yourself in their shoes, Kim continued. Not everyone wants to take on a pitcher who serves only change-ups. Taylor yelled that having quit his job and throwing a statement in his boss's face, he now had no money to support himself. Suddenly the phone rang. Both screaming immediately calmed down and both stared at the phone. Taylor rushed towards the table, where the phone continued to jingle, and extended his hand. An unfamiliar number appeared on the screen, and with trembling hands he pressed the answer button. The voice on the other end of the line asked Taylor. It was the coach of the Homeland Stars team, Goyang. While they were talking, Kim looked at the still trembling guy. Taylor hung up and howled like a wild animal. He's accepted, he yelled, throwing the phone to the sky. 
Early in the morning, the guy sat down to have breakfast. He ate as usual and watched the match on his tablet. There was no TV in the main character's house. The guy gradually realized what had happened, sighing. He thought that this was just the beginning of the journey. Taylor looked into the virtual manager. The glowing screen did not show anything interesting. Kim Jin-ho flew up to the guy and reminded him that he still had one silver roulette ticket. Inflated like a soap bubble, Taylor doubted whether to activate the ticket. Pointing his finger at the guy, Kim told him that it wouldn't be easy and a silver roulette ticket was his help. The flying ghost, as always, turned out to be right, and thanks to the bonuses, Taylor's characteristics slowly but surely improved. Peering into the cells of the solar drum, deciding what would happen, the guy spun the roulette. At the same moment, the dark sky lit up with a bright light. Kim Jin-ho and Taylor looked at the dropped cell together and did not see any benefit from the used ticket. On the virtual glowing screen, there was an inscription that one of the serves would become higher in rank. The effect would last for 24 hours. Kim was puffing about some kind of madness, and Taylor was already preparing a new game plan. There was little hope for a bonus. The plan was clear, but not very rosy. With the current status, Taylor could still lose to his opponent. And at this time, another warm-up was taking place at the stars of the Motherland Stadium. Pitchers were practicing throws, and batters were hitting them. Coach John Jonk spoke with the director. He has already notified the acceptance of three candidates and prepared a new schedule for the season. He reported to the director that this year there are expected to be 12 fewer matches, and in addition, there will be a 36th exchange match against a team of newcomers. The director, after listening carefully to the coach, thought about the fact that independent teams had already won 36 times. The professionals were not required to play against independent teams, but thanks to the official pros and baseball fans, this was the first time such an exchange match had ever taken place. From one game to another, and soon the 36th, each of them was an opportunity for Homeland Stars to experience the level of competition with the professionals. Director Chuck, having instructed the coach to work out a game plan with the Dragons, hurried to the upcoming meeting with the heads of the Soul Angels. The director left, and at that second the phone rattled in Coach John's pocket. A message, he thought, and looking at the phone began to read the delivered notification. He called out to dismissing director Chuck Biomson and told him that he had received a message from reporter Park from the sports news. The schedule may have to be changed and preparation done before the game with the Dragons, the coach said. While management was discussing future plans, Taylor arrived safely at the Homeland Stars training camp and checked into room number 302. Wandering around the room like a child, the guy showed Kim that he now had a good crib, a spacious room, and a soft chair. He admired the gym and training area and the cafeteria with tons of food. This pleasure cost only 700,000 a month, but Kim, as always, was sarcastic. He once played for 10 million a month. It was customary for players to pay themselves to get into baseball, but when they became professionals, they were paid, Kim explained. Living in a house on the roof, he could not even dream of anything more, and angry with Kim, rushed at him with his fists. Having calmed the guy down, Kim Jinho asked the guy to listen to an instructive story. To begin with, he explained that the major and minor leagues differ in the level of play, but the main difference is in the conditions. Kim said that when he was young like Taylor, he spent a whole season in the minor leagues. His skills were high, but he was not called up to the major leagues. He had to not only harden his mind, but develop a sense of thirst in order to feel this thirst and hunger for victories. It was then that Kim Jinho, having learned the lesson he had learned, remembered it for the rest of his life. After all, only those who felt this hunger in the lower league are capable of becoming real monsters in the major league. Finally, Kim advised the guy to never push himself into limits and always demand more. After that, Taylor stopped perceiving the joys that he got for 700,000 a month as the limit of what was possible. Taylor listened to Kim Jin-ho with great interest. It was a very instructive story, which he will remember for the rest of his life. Feeling that he had no closer friend and advisor than the ghost of Kim, they began to fool around. The guy, without hesitation, repeated Kim's laughter and immediately caught another joke from the house ghost. The sun was setting behind the stadium, and from the windows of the 302nd room came cheerful and fervent laughter. The day of the match between the stars of the motherland and the dragons arrived. The sky was clear, the sun was high. Taylor arrived at the stadium early in the morning and diligently warmed up for the upcoming match. Then a ghost appeared, asking how the starting pitcher was doing in his debut. Without looking up from his warm-up, Taylor showed off the arsenal of learned skills he had. Suddenly, Kim looked towards the moving figure. Wilson Miller, Mr. Hundred Points, was walking across the playing field. Taylor had no friends, 
and he decided to go and say hello to the guy if he didn't mind shaking hands with the one who once defeated him. Taylor approached the hundred-pointed guy and asked if he remembered their recent meeting. After hesitating for a while and rummaging around in his head, Wilson remembered the annoying little guy. Kim immediately put in his two cents, warning Taylor that this was a bad idea. The big-eyed guy was unperturbed and had no intention of continuing the dialogue, but Taylor tried to speak again, reminding him of his three home runs. Wilson's look said it all. He remembered very well how he almost got thrown out because of the shortness of the pitcher. When the hundred-point guy left, Taylor sat annoyed, and Kim laughed until he cried. Suddenly Taylor looked at Kim with horror in his eyes and pointed to the pitcher's mound. Some guy in all his glory, a pitcher from the Dragons team, was practicing pitches. He was brash and confident in his skill, confident in his icy serves, even now in a routine training session. This is Henry Hardy from the Black Crows team. He is considered the best pitcher at the moment, Taylor recalled. Henry was good at baseball, he was called Iron Shoulders, but in public he was considered a very controversial figure, all because of his own behavior. He had another nickname that suited him very well, Second Kim Jinho. The ghost of Kim watched Henry's throws and realized that he was not bad at all. Taylor, meanwhile, remembered that he had already been suspended from games for a year. Henry was capable of throwing balls at speeds of 100 and even 150 kilometers per hour. Having pounced enough, Henry moved out of the playing field towards Taylor. Like a mountain, he moved closer and closer. And when he approached at arm's length, Taylor looked like a small dog against his background. Henry arrogantly, from his height, looked at the 16th number on Taylor's uniform and grinned impudently. He extended his hand to the guy, and Taylor thought that now this thug would crush him like a bug. Henry ruffled the hair of the little rat from the independent team of Motherland Stars. That's exactly how he was reflected in his gaze. Taylor was not at a loss. He looked intently into the eyes of the thug, listened to his verbal attacks and sharply threw his hand away from his head. Well, now it's clear who and what they were. An electric charge ran between them. The game started any minute. The Motherland Stars and Dragons teams greeted each other. Director Chuck Bomson watched the players closely from his observation deck, his gaze directed towards center field. Henry Hardy is the best pitcher of the current era of professional baseball, and he was among the players on the Dragons team. Who knew that after the disqualification, Henry would be sent to play in a friendly match with the Homeland Stars, and Taylor would have to compete with him. Coach John Zhang was not sure that the guy should have played today, and he asked director Chuck, who was closely monitoring the situation, about this. While expressing his opinion to the director regarding the upcoming match, he was worried that Taylor would lose all motivation and interest in baseball. Taylor was also worried that no matter what he showed in the qualifying games, he would still have aces up his sleeve. A glowing screen activated in front of the guy's face and reminded him of bonuses and points. Ghost Kim Jinho and Taylor, having discussed a serious opponent, developed a strategic plan for a skirmish with Henry. Reporters gathered at a friendly match of the Independent League, and it was not surprising they came to film the match with second Kim Jinho. Having concluded that Taylor and Henry were no match for each other, he doubted whether he should even take part in the match. Grinning, Taylor decided to follow his plan and throw his crap serves. Rereading the messages on the glowing screen, the guy decided that he would simply show what he was capable of. The game had begun and was in full swing. The Homeland Stars catcher was preparing for his pitcher's next pitch, and the Dragons batter was grinning confidently. There were elderly men sitting in the stands. They were cheering for the Dragons team. Be careful, they shouted, encouraging their batter. These were not just fans. These were veterans. Older colleagues who had once played at the professional level and were not here for fun. These people are the best when it comes to non-professional baseball. They, as senior colleagues, have already dealt with losing games. All of them, led by respected director Alan Brown, came here on their day off to help the juniors become their best. Director Allen carefully watched not only the game, he gazed intently at the impudent player who was whistling under his breath. This impudent person neglected everything. He didn't even intend to follow the game. He played, tossed the ball up and caught it, tossed it and caught it. Sometimes it was not possible to catch the baseball, and it fell safely to the floor. And meanwhile, the game in the stadium continued. The impudent one picked up the rolled ball, knocked it on the floor and continued his fun, but soon he would start playing. He unceremoniously continued to whistle his stupid songs, and nothing stopped him, not even the presence of respected veterans nearby. Director Brown turned to the impudent and impudent young man who continued to sit on the bench without moving and twirling the ball in his hand. The respected veteran called Henry by name again. He patiently waited for the guy to deign to respond. 
Silence followed again as Henry deliberately ignored director Alan Brown and pretended that no one was around. Unable to bear it, the respected veteran came close to the guy and called his name for the third time. Henry responded, calling the director an old man. Seeing that there was no smell of upbringing here, the director got angry, grabbed the unscrupulous guy by the hand, and squeezed it tightly. The ball fell out of his hand. Seething with indignation, Alan Brown sent the impudent guy to warm up on the field, warning that he was, first of all, a coach, not an old man. The young man snapped venomously. He was full of rudeness, rudeness, and cynicism. Reminding who is who, Coach Allen cynically warned Henry to be careful in his words and actions. Demonstratively turning away from the director, the insolent angrily hissed another nasty thing in response. Henry took the field and headed toward the pitcher's mound as the game took a different turn. He had no shortage of strength, speed, and ball control. He considered himself the best pitcher of the present time, which is why he was so daring. Henry threw pitches, and the coaches of the Homeland Stars team, out of curiosity, measured the speed of his baseball. After some thought, the Stars coaches decided it was time for batter Wilson Miller to shine and called him out first. The figure of the 100-point batter took position in the home plate, ready to hit pitcher Henry's pitches, and he began to take aim with his bat. Taylor watched, waiting behind the player's bar for his start as a pitcher, and he asked Kim if the 100-pointer would get his mark. The answer was no, as the Dragons were able to get the first and second batter out with regular pitches, and Wilson would have a hard time hitting the ball. With his leg high, Henry swung and pushed the ball out with his fingers. It flew without spin and Wilson swung the bat. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho believed in the 100-point monster and his return to the Motherland Stars team when he hit the second serve. On the third throw, Henry prepared curve, a complex curved serve and masterfully spun the ball into the throw. The trajectory of the flight was complex. Batter Wilson Miller, being not so simple, calculated the pitcher's plans in advance, and it was Curve who was waiting. Taylor watched the game progress. He had difficulty digesting what was happening. Kim also did not understand why Henry ignored the signs of his team. The impudent bastard Henry was very cunning. He was not going to close out his first inning with a strikeout, especially after a long break. Taylor understood everything. Henry would throw his curve and use his swing. He would force Wilson to swing his bat and miss the ball. While the Dragons pitcher, in his brazen manner, threw the ball. The batter held his bat so as not to waste time lowering it before hitting. Wilson had his eye on the ball from the moment he served it, and he turned his torso and hips using all the strength of his body and struck the ball. After hitting the ball, batter Wilson Miller threw his bat and ran around the perimeter of the square to first base to defend it. Having earned one point for the team, Wilson returned to the player's stand, exchanging a few words with the Dragons catcher along the way. Taylor stood in amazement. He couldn't believe his eyes. Kim Jin-ho danced in the air, praising the guy. With a confident step, Wilson walked towards Henry Hard, looking into the eyes of his opponent, who threw sparks. Passing by, the guy noticed that Henry's eyes were filled with hatred and contempt. Strikeout change, the umpire called, and Henry threw down his catch glove. He lounged on the bench behind the player's counter again paying no attention to the veterans. One got the feeling that he didn't give a damn about anything. A player from the Dragons team, a catcher with whom Henry had just played, came up to greet his partner. He said that he was still in great shape. Extending his hand for a handshake, the catcher thanked Henry for the game and praised his strength and dexterity, despite the year of suspension. Henry suddenly grabbed the guy's wrist and squeezed it with all his might, feeling as if a vice was tightening. The guy screamed in pain. Well, sycophant, feel my strength, the insolent man said, squinting his eyes, continuing to squeeze the guy's hand. Dragons coach Alan Brown intervened in the situation. He demanded to stop immediately and immediately let go of the guy's hand. Having underestimated his opponent, allowing him to earn a point, Henry took his anger out on his own guys from the Dragons. Veteran Alan persistently asked Henry to maintain order and calm, but his patience was coming to an end. He advised the guy to pull himself together and think about today's game if he wants to return to professional sports. Don't relax. You'll come out in the second half of the game. Coach Allen finished his speech and everyone went to their places. The match continued. After three outs were called by the umpire, Taylor deliberately threw the ball high outside the strike zone. The guy was returning to the player's counter before his next appearance on the field. He caught Henry's eye as he watched his throws. Well, the arrogant best pitcher, Taylor thought sarcastically and a slight grin crossed his face. I see you. He gestured to Hardy and pulled his lower eyelid down. It was a gesture of defiance and contempt. The match continued. The Dragons team was on the defensive. The Motherland Stars attacked, but not always successfully. The referee called another strikeout. 
The experts watched the game from their referee booth and discussed Henry's personality. Despite the year of rest, he was in excellent shape. Meanwhile, Dragons coach Alan Brown was talking with an arrogant and daring personality, so animatedly discussed by experts. Coach Allen, trying to influence Henry's personality, suggested that he take a closer look at his opponent, a pitcher from the Homeland Stars team. Any attempts to talk to the player remained unsuccessful, and Coach Allen Brown grew tired of the efforts. The true opponent of the Dragons was Taylor, and not just a batter from the Stars of the Motherland. This was the conclusion the veteran made, having long ago turned his attention to the guy. Taylor went out to the St. Petersburg Hill. The coach announced his exit when the Homeland Stars team went on the defensive, and Kim, as always, threw out his advice. Kim loaded the guy with various tricks with change-ups and encouraged him not to give up under the pressure of circumstances. Taylor was preparing to throw to the attacking team. Opposite him was an opponent with a 35-point rating. The Dragons batter had only Taylor's change-ups on his mind, and he was preparing to hit them. The main character decided to use his secret weapon and score as many points as possible. Kim, who suddenly appeared, intervened as always, and sowed doubts with his questions when the guy was already preparing to throw the ball. He hastened to remind Taylor of their old conversation, or rather advice, or rather a lesson learned. In the affirmative, without a drop of doubt, Taylor nodded his head and prepared to put on a show. The guy wrapped his fingers around the ball on the seam, twisted his wrist hard, and threw it with a slight deflection into the right corner. The dragon's batter was not ready. From his position, he could only hit a change-up. He could not change his position and react quickly. He turned out, but lost his balance. An interesting, very interesting pitcher. He hit a good pitch, a slider, an expert was discussing at the referee's table. The referee announced the end of the fourth inning and the stars of the motherland went on the attack. Now the defense will be with the dragons. Taylor lounged at the player's counter while the virtual manager flashed glowing messages, adding bonus points for achievements. He was upset. There were a lot of bonuses in front of him, but he received them only for his first achievements, and the guy didn't understand what would happen next. Like a child hungry for a toy, he took a moment to imagine what he could get after his first victory. From the opposite side of the stadium, Taylor and his joyful lunges were watched by the director of veterans, coach Alan Brown. Director Allen once again became convinced that the guy from the Homeland Stars team is interesting not only for his good change-ups. While the Dragon trainer was lost in thought, Henry approached him. He was very annoyed. The Dragons didn't steal a single base, didn't score a single run, and were pitched by such a crap pitcher, Henry said. Finally, the impudent man realized that there were other players besides him and headed to the serving circle to take up defensive positions. Playing so poorly even in a simple match between independent teams was a huge blow to Henry's pride. Having killed batter Wilson Miller, Hardy intended to urgently return to professional sports before he completely sunk here. Wilson Miller took a position in the home zone. He was not afraid of either Henry's opponent or his threats. Henry was preparing to serve the Kuvra, his signature throw, making his opponent think that the ball would fly straight. The ball actually flew straight and then abruptly changed its trajectory, but the batter, who was watching the ball, still hit it. The force of the blow sent him out of bounds and the umpire called a home run. Henry was not happy. He looked at the ground in frustration, and the home run announced by the umpire completely enraged him. When the batter was able to hit the bunt, Henry screamed at the top of his lungs and called Wilson a vile bastard. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho took a closer look at Hardy and concluded that he was completely crazy. These were indeed no longer the eyes of a pitcher. These were the eyes of an animal full of hatred and thirst for revenge. While Taylor was chatting with Kim, Homeland Stars coach John Zhang approached him and asked him to come out in the fifth inning. Taylor thanked the coach for the offer and happily agreed to join the game. Journalists surrounded the experts, they interviewed them and bombarded them with questions. But the outcome of the game was unknown. It seems that the experts have only the last word left to say drawing their conclusions from the not yet completed game. Batter Wilson, with the eyes of a hunter, looking to finish off the beast, could well have become the star of the game instead of Henry Hardy. Or maybe there's another one, the expert thought as he studied the throw metrics on his computer screen. The contender was pitcher Taylor Brand. Small, bouncy, with a pretentious stance and unexpected pitches. The match continued into the fifth inning. Taylor played his innings and sat down to rest on the player's bench. Coach John Jonk approached the guy to cheer him up, did a good job, he said, offering to cool down. Having not played until the end of the fifth inning, Taylor, not very confidently, asked why he was being sent to the bench. Coach John and the guys from the Homeland Stars team encouraged the guy, appreciating his excellent result from only strikeouts. 
Taylor was very afraid that without his participation in the second half of the game, the team would lose their advantage, and then there would be no victory in sight. Now he was just an observer. He will no longer be able to go to the mound in this game. The further result depends only on his team. The ghost encouraged Taylor. The outcome of the game was not at all clear, and there was no point in being sad. Running onto the playing field, the guys from the stars of the motherland rushed to victory. They perfectly understood that thanks to Taylor, they had a chance. You must win. These parting words were spoken by the coaches to their players before being brought into the game. The result depended on the guys leading the game on the field. They only had to defend one point. The Homeland Stars were determined to win and determined to make Dragons pitcher Henry Hardy a loser. Taylor shouted to the team, go ahead, and Kim Jin-ho watched in surprise as the short man screamed like a giant. When the game ended, the Homeland Stars celebrated their victory, Taylor becoming the winning pitcher for the first time. While the Homeland Stars players were rejoicing, director Chuck Byamson was having telephone conversations with the Seoul Angels team leader, Miss Jessica. After reading the sports news, she persistently asked for another match to be held for everyone interested and for the press. By demonstrating their skills, the baseball players could become members of the Seoul Angels professional team. Director Chuck tried to change the situation, citing the fact that the team members were tired, but Jessica categorically suggested playing a second team. Raising her voice, the lady concluded that Wilson Miller should be number four at first base in this game. Director Chuck Bomson could no longer hold his own and had to give in and agree with her. The next morning came. All the guys from the Motherland Stars team were resting after a tense game in their rooms at the sports club. During yesterday's match, the stadium was full of journalists, and the main character was looking through the sports news feed. Pointing his finger at the phone screen, Taylor happily informed the ghost of Kim Jin-ho that he had found an article right on the main page. While the guy was happy, Kim was also happy. But first he had to look at the bonuses he had earned, and he whispered about this in his ear. In between, the main character wanted the system manager to give him a ticket to Platinum Roulette for yesterday's winnings. And he immediately blushed. Taylor just wanted something worthwhile to come up, so that he could get a chance to get into the world of professionals. The batters he defeated were nowhere near the skill level of those he had yet to face. The main character wanted to make his contribution to the world of baseball, but he started too late, and while his number was only 16, having exchanged the 4,000 points he had earned for a bronze ticket, Taylor, heeding Kim's advice, decided to use roulette. Coming closer to this luminous miracle, Taylor and Kim carefully looked at the cells of the drum and realized that nothing useful would fall out there. After thinking for a minute, we decided to rotate it anyway and turned the drum with all our might. When the roulette stopped, Kim was happy as a child. Taylor was upset. The guy's stamina increased by one level, and the glowing screen displayed useless messages one after another. While Kim continued to mock, Taylor said that he had another ticket, only this time for gold roulette. He resolutely approached the drum, which was emitting a glow even brighter than before. They both looked with interest at the golden segments of the roulette. At that moment, Taylor dreamed of a super prize. A feeling of thirst for easy money arose in the guy, and he spun the luminous drum as hard as he could. From the outside, it seemed that the guy would explode and his nerves would explode and Kim tried to reason with him, because life should not be uncontrollable. The drum was not going to stop, and the guys continued to shout in anticipation of the bonus they would receive. Kneeling down and closing his eyes, Taylor began to pray for the fulfillment of his cherished desire. The roulette stopped. Taylor carefully opened one eye and began to peer at the frozen cell of the drum. A blue glowing screen appeared and the guy read the message. It said that the fastball had been improved. Meanwhile, the coach and experts gathered in the office of the director of the Motherland Stars team. Chuck Biomsok told the audience that their team was given a lot of funding and all thanks to the loss of the Dragons, or rather, Henry Hardy. But it was necessary to face the facts and study the situation in more detail and thoroughly. Having won with a score of 1-0, batter Wilson Miller brought a point to the Homeland Stars team, and everyone agreed with this fact. Another fact is that all the batters failed to get a single base, and in the end, the victory was brought by pitcher Taylor, who was not on the team. At the end of the meeting, Chuck Byamsyak announced to the crowd that tomorrow there would be a friendly match with the Soul Angels. Journalists were planned to be present at the game, and it was unacceptable to allow a loss. The director continued his speech. It was the third hour of negotiations. It was necessary to discuss one more main point, the register of players. At tomorrow's game, from the side of the relief pitcher's zone, the director proposed Taylor as a shift man. Coach John was not happy. He tried to object to Chuck Bomsack, but the argument was the same, bringing victory. Taylor became an official player of the team. 
Meanwhile, Kim was sitting in the training room, explaining to Taylor how to throw an improved fastball obtained from the tape measure. The balls that the guy threw were not at all like a new skill and this made him even angrier. Taylor asked Kim to explain it more simply, but that was not the case. The ghost never looked for easy ways. Kim listed the varieties of fastballs. They come with four seams. Two, cutter, he said, bending the fingers of his right hand. Phantom hoped that Taylor now understood everything about fastballs and how important this pitch was for pitchers also dawned on him. Pitchers of the past have always made changes to their pitches, and over time there have been many changes, but one fact has remained constant. Pitchers always threw the fastball more than other pitches, Kim continued, as Taylor listened with interest. The more pitches the pitcher threw, the more difficult it was for the batter to cope, Kim lectured. Taylor wondered if he could only throw a four-seam fastball. Saying that in the era of fastballs nothing is more important than the speed and quality of these pitches, Kim took the guy by the shoulder. He pointed to the glowing screen. Taylor had an excellent improved serve skill, but the boy did not appreciate it. Angry, Kim rose above the guy and became scarier than a monster. His voice sounded like steel, scaring the protagonist to death. Having calmed down and decided that the guy needed to serve slow but shitty serves, the ghost transformed into its usual state. Taylor looked questioningly at Kim. He really wanted to survive among the monsters of baseball. While discussing a new roulette skill, Taylor received a message on his phone saying that he had been officially elected as a shift man for the upcoming game. The day came when Taylor, as part of the Homeland Stars team, arrived at the second string game of the Soul Angels. Taylor looked with interest at the country's second largest stadium and the largest investment in Soul Angels history. Looking up towards the spectator seats, the guy saw the figure of a young woman and a man standing next to him in suits with the emblem of the Soul Angels. He immediately recognized her as Miss Jessica the operations manager of the Soul Angels team. Having examined everyone and everything around them, Taylor and Kim Jinho, joyfully, headed to the counter of the stars of the Motherland players. Seeing his team's pitcher smirking and not at all focused before the game, Coach John Zhang became angry. Feeling his menacing energy, Taylor was forced to turn away from the piercing gaze. The guys from the Soul Angels team warmed up before the match by closely studying the opposing players. The ghost of Kim Jinho, having made himself comfortable at his observation post, concluded that the match would not be easy. After wishing Taylor good luck, the ghost escorted the boy to the field to warm up before the game. Manager Miss Jessica and coach of the Soul Angels watched the opposing players from the upper stands. Carefully examining each person involved in the game, her gaze settled on one of them. Interested in player number 16, she asked his name. It was the main character, Taylor Brandon, who greeted the players of the opposing team with his pathos. The coach listed all of Taylor's characteristics to Jessica, adding at the end that he has very sharp curveballs. Miss Jessica mumbled something under her breath and plunged into her memories. She turned 180 degrees and headed towards the exit without saying another word. For some reason, the player she was interested in reminded her of Kim Jinho, who played with her when she was still a very little girl. Meanwhile, the commentator and reporter, who took their places in the arbitration booth, greeted everyone present. The match was already being broadcast live, and the commentator wasted no time in introducing the team's leading players to the audience. First, he announced Ben Samvel, the first starting pitcher for the Soul Angels, proud, smart, and with a fastball. The second commentator announced Rob Philjohn, noting that he once defected from the pros to the Homeland Stars team. From the arbitration booth, ridicule and poisonous barbs rained down on the guise of the Soul Angels' rivals. Fans were bustling around looking for the rookie defector, and many came to see him. Closing his eyes for a moment, Taylor imagined what to expect from the pitching of Soul Angels pitcher Ben Samwell. The main character noticed that today's match foreshadowed a confrontation between great pitchers. Having stirred up the guy, the ghost of Kim Jinho ordered him not to take his eyes off the bench of the Soul Angels team. Coaches and opposing hitters alike all deserved Taylor's attention today. This condition of Kim was so that the guy would understand who the professionals are, and for this, their every move must be recorded in his own head. Meanwhile, the game gained momentum, informing the public that three home runs had been called by the umpire. The umpires rejoiced. The Angels of Soul played an excellent game, gaining points. They destroyed their opponents. The score was 11 to 1. The mood in the Motherland Stars team was depressed. The guys could not break through this wall of professionals. Carefully observing everything that was happening, Taylor noticed one interesting feature of the Soul Angels. Having called Kim, he, without even looking in his direction, continued to look at the opponent's bench. Taylor watched how their coach and players communicated with each other throughout the game, receiving practical advice and recommendations. It was a whole command mechanism, 
like a set of gears rotating among themselves, the guy concluded. Meanwhile, the Soul Angel's coach directed his batter to properly concentrate on hitting the ball. Having received the instruction, the batter entered the field from the experienced perspective of his coach. When the judge announced another hit, Taylor became very nervous. The stars of the motherland's chances of correcting the situation were becoming less and less. The guy changed pictures in his head. Until the second inning, everything was not bad. He analyzed the actions of each player. Taylor fumed when Kim interfered with his thought process, inserting his caustic jokes. Having estimated his current level of skills, it became clear to the guy that it would not be easy to resist this lineup of the Angels of Soul. But he was not going to give up. His desire to get to the big leagues did not stop him from playing against the second team players. Thoughtful. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho. Seeing the guy's confidence even for a moment compared him with himself. The Homeland Stars pitchers went inning after inning, and Taylor wondered why he wasn't being put into the game. Meanwhile, Coach John Jong was discussing with manager Chuck Bomson which of his pitchers to sacrifice in the next inning. While Taylor was chatting with the piss rack, the director agreed on the candidacy proposed by Coach Jonk. Turning to the guy, the coach ordered that he would take the field in the seventh inning. He sent him to warm up before the start, thinking that he didn't look good at all. Taylor, clenching all his will into a fist, with a clear plan in his head, went out to warm up before the game. In the warm-up zone of the Stars of the Motherland, a gloomy mood reigned. Everyone understood that the match was lost and it was impossible to win back the points. Accepting the idea that their opponents were professionals after all and not wanting complete defeat, they continued to play. It seemed out of reach for the guys from the Stars of the Motherland to climb the Mountain of Glory and beat the Angels of Soul. Having lost hope of doing their best and seizing every opportunity, the best players gave up before going on the mound. Seeing the depressed Homeland Stars veteran catcher Alan Brown, Taylor rushed out to meet him. The guy introduced himself to the veteran, but he had already heard a lot about the small pitcher and his minor achievements. The boy plucked up the nerve and carefully told Alan that he would use a special fastball in his inning, because his release was coming soon. Prepared to catch Taylor's special fastballs, Alan Brown took his position in the warm-up zone. The veteran liked the boy's attitude towards everything that was happening, but he didn't expect much from this warm-up. Taylor served his special fastball, which only he understood. Even for the veteran Alan, it was something new. Alan Brown, a former professional, an experienced baseball player, caught this fastball with surprise and at the same time horror in his eyes. Meanwhile, the Motherland Stars missed another serve and their attempt to return to the top ended with another miss. Warming up the spectators of the match with their caustic statements, the commentators announced the replacement of the Stars of the Motherland pitcher. Taylor walked onto the mound with a swagger, a clear understanding of his tactics and the prospect of changing the course of the game. While the guy was waiting for the judge's command, the reporters did not stop, continuing to talk about his achievements in their vile manner. They got on my nerves so much that Kim Jinho himself felt sorry for the pitcher boy because of these caustic statements. Taylor was unpleasant to hear all this. He was burning with anger from the inside. But the professionalism that the guy strived for was above all. Kim Jinho offered to show off all the skills and abilities, trying to praise and encourage the Homeland Stars pitcher as much as possible. On the Seoul Angels side, the mound was occupied by a batter with a rating of 69 points. He listened carefully to his coach, and he read out the opponent's characteristics. Having assessed the information received from the coach, the batter decided that he should not expect anything great from the small pitcher. Having received the command to start the seventh inning, the batter prepared to take light balls. Taylor, warming up with veteran Alan Brown, threw the baseball in his own style. The batter, expecting only a change-up from the pitch, looked in confusion at the curved ball flying past him. The umpire called an out when the ball landed safely in the Homeland Star's catcher's trap. Not understanding how to comment on the situation, reporters suggested that this mistake was just an accident. Seeing how the ball simply floated past the batter's bat, some doubt that this was a tactical move by the stars of the motherland still arose in their heads. The Seoul Angels coach was furious, and Miss Jessica, who had been watching her players play all this time, was confused. Once again, having replayed Taylor's serve in her head, Jessica realized that it was not only the speed of rotation of the ball, there was something else that her mind had not figured out. Kim was no less surprised than the others. Taylor launched the ball and it spun at breakneck speed. In the bottom of the seventh inning, Taylor switched between a fastball and a changeup, sending Soul Angels batters to strikeout. Peering into the distance, director Chuck Biamsak understood that the team spirit was depressed and the situation was unlikely to be corrected. Having lost all interest and hope, the guys from the Stars of the Motherland looked like they were dead. 
It wasn't that they didn't believe in themselves, they didn't want to win. Looking at each player individually with an experienced eye, director Chuck smiled slightly. He saw two newcomers who, despite the terrible result of the match, did not lose heart and played like the last time. Taylor was returning to the bench after the seventh inning. The ten-run deficit was out of reach for him. Screaming at the top of his lungs, Kim Jin-ho tried to awaken the beast in the guy and set the soul angels on the batters. The upset boy could not change anything and deliberately sent direct pitches straight into the hands of the batter. He promised himself that he would never find himself in this situation again the next time he climbed the pitcher's mound. Having heard such correct beliefs from Taylor, Kim saw before him a real future professional. Miss Jessica, the team leader of the Soul Angels, was present at the game and watched with curiosity as the guy was throwing sparks of disappointment. Remembering Taylor's name, she sat in her thoughts for a long time. The next morning on the training field at the Stars of the Motherland Club, Coach John Jonk was conducting training with the guys, but he mostly paid his special attention to the boy's pitcher, constantly worrying about his health. He asked the guy not to strain himself, not to overdo it with the load and be sure to warm up before serving. Coach John has felt sorry for pitchers since the days when they had to throw an incredible number of innings. Having lost his career early due to the enormous workload, the guy was now under the tutelage of Coach John. In his youth, studying the fates of such players, John Jonk longed to prevent their illnesses, or at least somehow alleviate them. Having studied the human skeleton and researched medical indicators, he became a trainer and applied the acquired knowledge in practice. The baseball players, obediently following his recommendations, gratefully appreciated his work and care. Early in the morning, Taylor came to the training room. Seeing the coach doing his usual thing, he bowed to him with joy. Determined to train, the guy asked Coach John what movements and serves to practice first. Without looking up from his work, the coach sighed with concern, inviting the boy to hone his usual movements on his own. Not receiving proper attention from the coach, Taylor was very upset and lowered his head and cried quietly. Having put forward his version to Kim that he was kicked out of the team, the guy sobbed bitterly, his tears rolling down his face in streams. The ghost, having cheered up the whiny boy and assured him that everything was fine, offered to continue training together as before. Captivated by their training, they did not notice how two figures, animatedly talking, moved to the side towards them. Pitcher Wilson Miller, accompanied by coach John Zhang, walked into the back hallway, receiving certain instructions. The Blue Sharks team manager was waiting for them at the appointed place. He handed Wilson a business card, promising a guaranteed fee. Taylor and Kim, hiding around the corner, spied and eavesdropped on the bright prospects that not every baseball player has access to. Wilson Miller, after hearing the offer to play one season with the Blue Sharks, weighed the pros and cons in his head. After thinking carefully, he thanked the Blue Sharks manager for his trust and opportunity and refused. The guy's unexpected refusal took the Blue Sharks coach by surprise. Returning the business card to his jacket pocket, he annoyedly left with nothing. Coach John Jonk was also in shock, cursing at Wilson Miller as he caught up with the rapidly departing Blue Sharks manager. Wilson felt embarrassed. With his refusal, he had let down not only the manager of the Blue Sharks, but also the coach of the Stars of the Motherland. But he was not going to change his decision. Heading towards the exits, the guy heard some noise and saw red hair sticking out from around the corner of the corridor. Taylor realized that he had been discovered. He came out to meet the guy, awkwardly greeted him, pretending that he had just arrived. On the fly, he made up a story about how he was late, returning to training here but apparently not very believable. Wilson immediately realized that Taylor had been eavesdropping and became an unwitting witness to the conversation with the Blue Sharks coach and manager. Burning with shame, Taylor admitted that he deliberately hid. He apologized to the guy, asking him not to tell anyone about it. Taking pity on the guy, who seemed very kind and trusting to him, Wilson called out to him and offered to chat. Seeing how the guy tries hard in training and longs to become the best, he inquired about his future plans in baseball. Taylor said that if he had the opportunity to choose, he would definitely want to get into a team that would allow him to play for them for one season. As he listened to Taylor talk about his plans to get into the big leagues, Wilson realized that he had just turned down just such an offer. Taylor continued to chat, showing off his trained hands, enjoying the interaction with the personality of Wilson Miller. The figure of Coach John appeared on the horizon. He loudly called Taylor by name, interrupting the guy's conversation. Hearing that Principal Chuck Bomson was waiting for him in his office, he wished Wilson good training and hurried. Not wanting to hesitate, Taylor ran towards the director's office, discussing with Kim what this meant. As Wilson Miller watched the runaway little guy, he started thinking about the big leagues and doubted turning down the Blue Sharks' offer. 
After the conversation and the words he heard, Taylor left the director's office, barely able to control himself. He asked the ghost of Kim if he understood and heard everything correctly, continuing to not believe his eyes and ears. While Taylor imagined his new life, Kim confirmed that everything was correct, and the director's decision to offer to play with the Blue Sharks was also correct. The Blue Blue Sharks were in minor league baseball, winning cup after cup, and were in the top spot for six years. But in the last season, something went wrong and it was all due to the weak position of the pitchers, their throws were unsuccessful match after match. Every Blue Sharks fan and cheerleader knew one truth. The team had incredibly capable batters. Imagining himself as the starting pitcher, Taylor painted pictures of his new history, which would begin with a victory over the Blue Sharks. Kim's ghost brought the guy back to reality, warning him that if he didn't prove himself in the upcoming match, he would be kicked out of the Homeland Stars team. He suggested looking into a baseball manager to see if the guy's skills would allow him to stick around in the minor leagues. Taylor grinned sarcastically, reminding Kim Jinho that he promised to become his personal trainer and help if necessary. Kim was furious at such impudence and warned that he was not going to help someone who was weak and indecisive to the challenges of fate. Not anticipating such a reaction, Taylor was afraid that, having been offended, the ghost would disappear from his life forever and begged to forgive him for the words he had said. Enraged, Kim definitely decided to teach the guy a lesson and prove that being the number one starting pitcher is very difficult. Poking his finger in his face, he shouted about the integrity of his intentions and longed to see readiness for any difficulties, full of pain and suffering. From Kim Jinho's anger, it seemed that everything around was blazing with fire, and Taylor realized that this was the end of his pranks. The path ahead was hellish. On the day of the scheduled match between the Homeland Stars and the Blue Sharks, the weather was clear and sunny. Blue Sharks manager Mr. Thomas was in an aggressive mood after an unpleasant conversation the day before with Homeland Stars batter Wilson Miller. When his plan to get Wilson on his team failed, the Blue Sharks immediately felt the coach's mood change. His gloomy state and emotional reactions affected the psyche of every baseball player, bringing up bad thoughts. Wilson Miller has been as good as ever in the hitter position and has already earned one run for the team with a home run. The manager of the Soul Angels was indignant. Anger accumulated inside him and rolled over in a lump on the players of his team. Having gathered the guys from the Stars of the Motherland, Coach John Jonk gave them instructions, explaining positions and tactics during the match. He advised pitcher Taylor not to show his intentions right away, but to use the pitch as a warm-up. The position of the starting pitcher and the uncertainty of the outcome of the match made the guy nervous and overexerted. Taking chewing gum from his back pocket, he asked the coach for permission to use anti-stress. In baseball, Chewing gum aided concentration, so the coach willingly supported the player's request. Taylor, taking the pitcher's mound and taking his concentrate, prepared for his team's defensive position. Blue Blue Sharks, from their waiting area, watching the Homeland Stars play, discussing the strengths and positive advantages of some of the players. The Blue Sharks batter was also a capable and experienced fellow. He figured out what kind of pitch he could expect, knowing the slow speed of his opponent. As he prepared to attack, he concluded that it was all a matter of correct timing, taking into account the slow speed of the flying ball. Convinced of the correctness of his thoughts and having the skills to hit a slow ball, the batter looked with the eyes of a winner. Heeding Coach John's advice, Taylor served the ball slowly in his signature manner, taking up a defensive position. The umpire called a strike when the ball flew safely past the Blue Sharks batter's bat and landed in the catcher's catcher of the Homeland Stars. The successfully delivered first serve confused the Blue Sharks batter and cast doubt on the correctness of his calculations. Taylor served his second serve at medium speed, trying to make life easier for his teammates. The flying ball, approaching the baseball home, suddenly changed direction and the Blue Sharks batter, thinking slowly, missed again. Sticking two fingers of his right hand up, the referee called a second strike. The batter couldn't believe his eyes. Depressed, he prepared for the pitcher's third throw, hoping to still hit the ball. Meanwhile, Taylor was thinking through his third serve, training his hands and twisting them in the air. This time, he decided to throw the curver, imagining the resulting arc along which the thrown ball would fly. Using his skill, Taylor did his job and kept a close eye on the movement of the ball. Despite the batter's attempts to hit the ball, the catcher caught it for a third time, and the umpire called a strikeout. The first inning ended, and Taylor read the baseball manager's messages and tallied his scores. Kim Jin Ho, Appreciating the strategy of the starting pitcher of the Homeland Stars, looked at him approvingly. Boastfully praising himself for a worthy start to the game, Taylor raised his nose to the skies. The ghost of Kim Jin-ho, advising the boy to go down to earth, almost broke his silence. 
promising not to help the guy. Once again, deprived of the pleasure of basking in the rays of his pride, Taylor became slightly depressed. Meanwhile, the game continued. The Homeland Stars went on the offensive, and batter Wilson Miller brought one point after another to the team. Reporters and journalists who arrived at the game discussed his candidacy, considering him a real find for baseball. Having played the first inning and striking out three batters, Taylor also came to the attention of journalists, surprising him with a quick change of players. Despite all of Taylor's efforts and tactics, baseball experts were more inclined to believe that the guy was simply lucky. The Soul Angels coach and other experts arrived at the game to observe player Wilson Miller. He was very interested in this particular candidate, but he did not ignore Taylor, whose person was actively discussed by journalists. Meanwhile, the star's pitcher, so actively discussed by those around him, was resting behind the player's counter, waiting for his next outing. While watching the Homeland Stars, the ghost of Kim Jin-ho noticed the uselessness of the team's batters, whispering about it to Taylor. At the same time, he also noticed one strange feature among the Blue Sharks batters, pointing his finger towards the opponents. The batter of the offensive team was shaking like a leaf, afraid of missing a pitch from a pitcher with crap speed. Immediately, Taylor remembered the Soul Angels batters who tried every trick to hit pitches without flinching. Not once. The main character decided that the weakness of his opponents was to his advantage, but his health level also completely dropped, as indicated by the glowing screen. Taylor entered the fifth inning determined not to deviate from his earlier plan and continued to throw slow pitches to his opponents. Throwing his special fastball, the glowing screen showed a message that his remaining health points had been completely used up. The pitch was successful, and there was no limit to the jubilation of the Homeland Stars pitcher, who finished the fifth inning perfectly. But Kim ruined everything again with his nasty, suspicious laugh, once again bringing the guy back to reality. Taylor was exhausted from the game and lost his health level. Kim Jin-ho read about this in the notice from the baseball manager. All he had to do was warn the guy that from this moment, his hellish path blazing with fire begins. The guy apparently forgot what the ghost warned him about, being angry, and looked at him questioningly, waiting for an explanation. Taylor lost his strength, but the trembling in his body did not leave him when Coach John Jonk called him. He praised Taylor with undisguised joy, and smiling thanked him for his diligent play. The coach proudly asked the main character if he could throw even more serves, and this question sounded like a death sentence. And only now did Taylor realize what Kim Jin-ho was talking about, and what hellish path, full of pain and suffering, he was warning about. In past games, he had only played first pitcher, supporting his team's performance. Today, the responsibility as a starting pitcher was much greater, and the role of the main character was to set the pace early in the game. Taylor recalled how he pitched a perfect fifth inning, sending all batters without runs or home runs. And he remembered the director of the Homeland Stars, Chuck Bomson, who, like any expert, would never replace a pitcher with another player. The coach brought Taylor back to reality by continuing his discussion about the game in the next inning. Taylor wanted to report his weakness in the body, but did not convince the coach and complain about his health. After thinking, the guy decided to go out onto the field and do everything that could depend on him and try to earn extra points. John Jong had high hopes for his pitcher and once again encouraged him by calling him the star of the pitcher's mound. The umpire's announcement to replace players was the command to start a new inning and for the guy to go into the serving circle. The glowing screen gave out one after another devastating messages, and what awaits the main character is known only to God and Kim, who suddenly disappeared.